Now, God, let me ask a question, is God subject to gravity? I don't think so. So God is not somebody who has lots of time. God is somebody who's outside the dimensionality of time altogether. And that's what Isaiah means when he says it, thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Now, how does he, if he has the technology to create us in the first place, does he have the technology to get a message to us? Of course. The problem is, how does he authenticate his message? How does he let us know that the message we possess is really from him and not some kind of contrivance or some kind of fraud? How many of you here in the audience believe that this is the word of God? Wonderful, that's the politically correct response <laughs> in this community. Outside, maybe not so, but here, okay. The question you need to ask yourself desperately is how do you know? And you, as a member of the Christian community, are going to be in the coming months, coming years, challenged in a way that will require you to really know why you believe this is the Word of God. God authenticates it by declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Only God has that capability, not angels, not any other created thing, only God himself. And he demonstrates that this is from him, how? By writing history before it happens. We have a tough time even thinking about two-dimensional, three-dimensional time. But let's imagine that this curve through three-dimensional space is a line that represents our timeline. Let's imagine some being is outside our dimensionality of time. And in our dimension of time, we have the past, the present, the future, as we experience it going through this line, right? Now, an analogy here would be like the parade that's going on right now through Roswell. If you're sitting on the curb watching these floats come around the corner, for you on that curb, that parade is a linear sequence of events. But if you are outside the plane of that, of that parade, say in a helicopter above the parade, you can see the beginning at the end at the same instant. That's a clumsy analogy, but I think you get the idea. Now that means that even though for us it's past, present, and future, from someone in eternity who can watch the past, the present, and the future, it's in common, so to speak, for the one in eternity. I'm going to suggest to you the great discovery in my life, and I hope it'll be in yours, is that in e each book of the Bible is a key part of an integrated message. Every name, every number, every detail, even the numerical structure behind the text is there it evidences skillful design. And as you discover that, you gain a whole different perspective and insight about what the Bible is really all about. Now let me give you a provocative example. When you're reading your book of Genesis, when you get to chapter 5, you tend to skip it. Chapters 1, 2, and 3, and 4 are exciting, meaningful, rich material. Chapter 6 on is the flood and all that business. And we're going to talk about that very meaningfully here in a little bit. But chapter 5, although it's a chapter you tend to skip, has something interesting. Bear with me, I want to show you something. In, chapter 5 is basically a genealogy of 10 guys from Adam to Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. 10 guys. It's just a genealogy, father, son, and their ages and stuff. And you read through that and you sort of say to yourself, what's that got to do with anything? And then you remember, gee, Chuck Bissler in one of these weird conferences said that everything in there is by design. Well, let's challenge that a little bit. See, our problem here is these are transliterated, not translated, from the Hebrew. And they're proper names. A Strong's Concordance or some of your other usual helps do not deal with proper names. You have to have a root dictionary and, and have some uh, deeper types of tools to engage this. Let's take a look at what these names mean. Adam's pretty easy. Adama means man. Seth means appointed. We know that we can glean this from Genesis 4.25. When Eve gave birth to Seth, she felt he was appointed to be a replacement for Abel whom Cain slew. It says so in verse 25 of chapter 4, previous chapter. 
The word, the root Seth, first that the word Seth comes from, uh, implies appointed. Enosh is his son, which it's a word that it comes from the root Anash, which means incurable. It's used of a wound or a grief, woe, sickness, or wickedness, what have you. It means it, it essentially means mortal, frail, or miserable. Tough handle to go through school with, I imagine. Now, Kenan is mistranslated in some of your Bibles because it's assumed, a uh, Bible translated assumed it was an Aramaic, would call it Canaan. No, it's Kenan. In fact, uh, Balaam makes a pun on the name in Numbers 24. Kenan means sorrow or dirge or elegy, is what the name means. Mahalalel, kind of a mouthful, but a neat name. It, uh, it comes from two parts Mahalal, which means the blessed or praise, and the second part is El, the name for God. Mahalalel means the blessed God. Is one way to render that uh, that uh, inference. Yared is a verb from Yared meaning shall come down. In fact, some scholars assume that in his days is when the intrusion of the strange things of Genesis 6 began, but that's conjecture. His son is Enoch, which means commencement or teaching. Now, Methuselah is a very, very interesting name, often misunderstood by many commentators, but it comes from two roots. The word muth, it, it's a root that means death. It occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means to bring or send forth. Methuselah actually means his death shall bring. Now, what may surprise you is the flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. It had been preached on for four generations. Enoch, his father, apparently had a vision that as long as his newly born son was alive, the flood, the judgment flood, would be withheld. And he names him, his death shall bring. Now, if we go through and study the genealogies, you'll discover the year that Methuselah dies is the year the flood came. The prophecy was fulfilled. Interesting prophecy. Can you imagine raising that kid? Every time he caught a cold, I imagine the whole neighborhood went in a panic. <laughs> His son is named Lamech, and here the root is a root we still use today. It comes from a root in our, it was in our English word, lament or lamentation. It really means despairing. And his son is Noah. How many of you have heard of Noah? We've got about 70%, Jim. I think we've got a real problem here. Okay. No, I'm kidding. But we've heard the name Noah. What does the name mean? It is right from Nacham, which means to bring relief or comfort. Comfort or rest. And you can get this from verse 29 of chapter 5, because when Lamech names me, he indicates that. So these are, these are pretty, uh, most of them are pretty well documented. Some of them take a little digging. Now, um, yeah, see, in verse 29, it says, He called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands, because the ground of the Lord hath cursed. So their term comfort, Nacham, is, is the root from which the word Noah comes from. So now, with this little bit of background, let's put it together. We look at Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. But now let's put together what we've learned. What does this genealogy say in English? Man is appointed mortal sorrow. But the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing Comfort or rest. Hallelujah. Hallelujah is right. You know, I love to do this because every time I do this a lot in different audiences, there's always a gasp. Always a gasp. Now, this is interesting for several reasons because here we have a good summary of the Christian gospel, but it's tucked away in a genealogy in the book of Genesis, which is part of the Torah. There's no way you will ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide the Christian gospel in a genealogy in their venerated Torah. No way. The fingerprints of the Holy Spirit are all over this thing. And the reason I like to use this as an example, and there's hundreds I could choose, but this is a simple one, because it demonstrates, among other things, the integrity of design. When you study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and take it seriously, you'll discover it all ties together. If you study the book of Revelation, you discover it's all in code, but every code is explained somewhere else in the scripture, and when you go through it properly, it takes you into every book in the Bible, and you realize the whole thing is a pre-planned package. Even though 40 different guys penned it over thousands of years,
I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.